We have a wonderful speaker for you today, uh, Theodore Roosevelt Scholar, who has spent over 27 years of her professional career researching the life of Theodore Roosevelt and other topics of historical interest. Dr. Kathleen Dalton comes to us today from Andover, Massachusetts, where she serves as the Cecil F. E. Bancroft Instructor of History and Social Studies and co-director of the Brace Center for Gender Studies at Phillips Academy. Educated at Mills College and John Hopkins University, Professor Dalton has been studying Theodore Roosevelt's life for most of her professional career. She has taught at Boston University, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and American, American University. She has held prestigious scholar uh, fellowships, two of them, one from the Gilder Lerman Institute of American History and the Charles Warren Center for American Studies and American History at Harvard University. She has published several books, but many of you are probably familiar with A Strenuous Life. Praised as the best one-volume biography of Theodore Roosevelt by the Library Journal, the New York Review of Books, and our own Clay Jenkins. <laughs> In his review of The Strenuous Life, James McGregor Burns had this to say. At a time when we yearn for great moral leadership and conviction, Kathleen Dalton brings back a man who marvelous, marvelously embraced these qualities in a continually dramatic account told with skill and grace. Ladies and gentlemen, please extend a warm North Dakota welcome to Kathleen Dalton. which is uh, don't turn in any papers with Wikipedia uh, as a source <laughs> because um, even though it is democratization of knowledge, um, it is often plagiarized. Did you know that? Um, that people take encyclopedia articles and then turn them around and put them in Wikipedia. Um, and uh, The Onion, I'm just telling Greg Wynn this, uh, that uh, The Onion has a satire of the American Revolution as interpreted by Wikipedia. Um, and that is, uh, 500 years ago, uh, 40 people started the revolution. That, uh, the Onion is a, um, a, a humor journal online, um, and it satir uh, satirizes <coughs> Wikipedia um, as an unreliable source of knowledge. And um, I have a nephew uh, who's a very bright kid, who's now a Turkish um, studies specialist for the federal government. Um, and uh, one of the pranks that he did as a high school student was to post uh, false things that um, Herman Melville had written on Wikipedia to see how long it would take for them to notice false knowledge because it's unmediated. And so people who put things up on Wikipedia, including some of my students, often take the material and just either plagiarize it or invent it. So uh, let me just say, Yes, it's good to have internet, and yes, this, we live in a revolutionary age, but one of the reasons to be educated, um, especially person to person, um, and one of the reasons to have a history education is to look very seriously and critically at your sources. Um, and one of the first things you learn in graduate school, and I'm sure that's true here, uh, for our master's degree students in history, uh, some of you I've met, is to consider your sources and to always look at the, you get a primary document or a secondary document, primary eyewitness, secondary is a book written about an event after um, it's happened. Um, and students can do this, um, anybody can do this. Look at when it was written, who wrote it, try to find out why, 
and look critically at some of the things that are said in that book. One of the things you can, I don't know if you have Barnes & Noble out here, many malls have them, you do, okay? All right. Um, um, I had some, when I went on a book tour after my book came out, um, I had the misguided assumption um, that local bookstores <coughs> would be more erudite and knowledgeable than the big corporations. And that I was sort of anti-corporate in my attitudes towards the book business. Well, <coughs> one of the things I learned, in fact, was that yes, what gets put out on the tables at these big corporate bookstores are, there's a bribing system that publishers use, product placement. Um, publishers pay to have um, these tables. Um, and so that what's out on the table when you walk into a big corporate bookstore is not necessarily quality goods. I know I probably don't need to say this, but I think the young students, you're just trying to, you're trying to figure out what's valid knowledge, what is truth, what is reliable. We live in an age where we're bombarded by a huge amount of information. And information is not knowledge. Information is stuff you get from the internet. Some of it's completely worthless. Um, and I just have to say, uh, I've had students turn in term papers. We all require term papers where they got all of their information from a, an extremist political site where they claim to have invented documents that FDR planned Pearl Harbor. Okay, not true. <laughs> not true. Okay, FDR did not plan Pearl Harbor. There's evidence that the United States had broken the Japanese code and that some people in the United States government had a clue that the initial attacks were, were going to be all over the Pacific and possibly Pearl Harbor, but it, that knowledge was not at the White House. Um, there's just no evidence for that, except on the internet. And um, students tend to look at internet uncritically because technology is seductive. It is so exciting. And it's one of those things that I, you know, I'm delighted and I'm thrilled to be here when you're on the, you know, kind of this takeoff moment with your digitization project. Um, and I just want to say the difference between your digitization project and what most uh, of internet is, is that this is reliable scholarly um, use of primary sources and students will be able to look at these things as primary sources. This is serious scholarship going up on the web. Um, and I, I hardly endorse it, and I believe in it, and I think it's a wonderful thing that you're doing. Um, internet, again, um, is addictive. Um, and I, let me just say, um, as somebody who um, has raised two children who are at the stage of being tired of hearing what I have to say, um, it's addictive, and a lot of people can't let go of internet. And yet, it's really important to step back and say, okay, what are the, the forms of judgment that I need to use in seeing what I'm looking at? Am I being persuaded by somebody who's put some stuff up to try to tell me falsehoods? Because there's a lot of false information there. So again, the first thing you learn in history graduate school is to consider your source. and I would argue that one of the reasons to study history, to do graduate work in history, um, and other fields, we're not the only field, although sometimes I feel that way, um, that in fact, learning how to judge a source critically is one of the most important things that you can do as a citizen. You have to, we're all gonna have to judge politicians. We all do judge politicians all the time. Um, looking at different sources, different sources of information. Good to read both sides um, of uh, the political spectrum and not and, and to go deeper than what news programs will often have you uh, say. So um, one of the th examples I can give you about considering the source is Theodore Roosevelt's strenuous life speech, which many people look at as a document of, um, am I getting some, I'm getting some feedback here. Well, I'll step, uh, step away. Um, Theodore Roosevelt said, and we've brought this up before in the symposium, um, that he, he gave this stirring speech, which was his address to an American society 
at an age of industrialization where most people weren't doing manual labor anymore and where they had more leisure time and more wealth than they'd ever had before. Uh, and he addressed Americans um, with this famous speech that historians have studied for decades. And it's, he said, it's not the doctrine of ignoble ease, but the doctrine of a strenuous life, the life of toil and effort, of, of labor and strife. So he was urging people to continue to embrace um, activity and energy and purpose, even if they weren't having to plow the fields so much anymore, or they weren't having to build their own houses, uh, that a modern industrial society would bring more wealth and comfort, but that people shouldn't sit around all day. Uh, that's certainly a message that he gave his children. He said, we should not be content to rot by inches in ignoble ease within our borders. Now, how you read that primary document depends in many ways on your own perspective. Uh, one of the things that's been interesting, uh, in his uh, strenuous life speech, he argues that America has to look beyond its own borders. And he, uh, as many people know, he was an imperialist. He believed that the United States should, after it won the Spanish-American War, take in the Philippines, um, uh, Puerto Rico, uh, and Cuba, uh, at least temporarily, and bring them into the American system be a little bit more like European imperial powers. Now, he moderated those beliefs, but uh, often foreign policy historians will look at the speech as TR's expansionist foreign policy. This is the first step down the road to Vietnam, or this is the first step down the road. Now, that's one way to interpret this speech. I think TR didn't have, I think he didn't have Vietnam in mind. I don't think he had, um, you know, he couldn't see the future. He was not, uh, a worldwide interventionist. He was much more of a regional, uh, he was much more interested in having an American sphere of influence in the Western Hemisphere. Um, he did believe in America getting involved in World War I, uh, but he, uh, he wasn't uh, a fight every war every time um, kind of a politician. Other people have looked at the speech and said uh, it's TR um, trying to get uh, Americans not to embrace scrambling commercialism. He uses that phrase, scrambling commercialism. Uh, he was arguing in, in many ways to say, okay, we've got this industrial revolution. We've made ourselves the most successful industrial nation on earth by 1900. Um, and in fact, it's time for us to think about other things as well. What kind of a country are we gonna be? Are we gonna have a humane way of life within our borders? Um, I have looked also at that speech, and um, one of the things that historians can do is ask different questions of your material. Uh, I asked the question of, well, who does this man hate most? And um, not saying that the other interpretations of the strenuous life speech um, aren't valid and don't have good points, but um, I found this quotation that TR had made when I was doing research um, at the Theodore Roosevelt birthplace in New York. And uh, in a uh, newspaper interview, he called rich playboys uh, cootie on the body politic. And um, I often have, have looked at this speech and taken that quotation, which is he hated rich playboys who he had grown up with, and he thought it was going to be terrible for America if they were going to be led by this, uh, the sons of J.P. Morgan or the sons of um, all of these uh, robber barons, uh, and that those children were not people of high moral purpose. And so I would argue that one of the, uh, the subtexts of the strenuous life speech, yes, there's, um, there's uh, American expansion, yes, there's, um, people should be physically active. TR was a very uh, enthusiastic defender of physical fitness. Uh, but there's also a moral tone to this speech, which is don't be like these horrible playboys he grew up with. One of the things that uh, is in my book is TR is a moralist. And people, have very, people in this room, I'm sure, have very different religious views and very different moral views. And uh, one of the things that I saw in TR was a consistent thread of moralism. And some historians have looked at that and said, well, that's a not a particularly appealing side of TR. 
I sort of liked it. I've always liked those WCTA, uh, WCTU ladies with the axes that would chop, chop down the bars in the late 19th century. I think those people are really fun. And um, the Victorians who put uh, little um, uh, doilies on the piano legs so people wouldn't see naked legs. Uh, the, the prudes and the, um, the, the Victorians have always seemed to me to be um, trying to tell us something in the sense that they were worried about the morality of their age. And some, they look prudish to us and they look uptight. Um, but they were people like us who were looking at their times. They didn't know where the future was going to go. And their concerns were largely about, um, you know, there's drink, there's sex, there's smoking, um, there's uh, lack of family um, loyalty. There are all kinds of things like that. And TR was Victorian. And you can read the strenuous life speech as a primary document. And um, because of what I knew about Victorian society and concerns of other people, um, I spent some more time talking about TR as a moralist. And I hope respectfully. I hope I was as respectful of his moralism because it was very much of the Victorian age. He was very much a creature of his age. Um, and that is, um, there's a famous story, well, I, I helped make it famous, where TR at the end of his life um, is, uh, works in a magazine office. He becomes an editor after he's uh, president. And um, it, it's a great moment. The boys, uh, the young reporters in the office, the magazine writers, like TR, this famous ex-president, um, and they say, oh, come have a drink with us after work, TR. And so um, they are, you know, he was a sociable guy, and so he went for a drink with other magazine writers and newspaper writers. And um, this is in the teens, so there's a little hint of the roaring 20s coming in with this younger generation of men. And um, they start toasting, um, and uh, they toast, uh, take a few drinks, and TR hears one young man say, here's to our sweethearts, our friends' wives. Mm. Well, what does TR do? What would a Victorian moralist do in this kind of social setting? Well, TR punched him out. <laughs> Um, and you know, uh, there's a there's a part of me that you know, okay, well, hitting people in public, I I can't ever, I don't ever say that I encourage you to do that. Don't try that at home. But um, there's something tremendously appealing about TR, feeling that that kind of cynical, yes, I'm going to sleep with your wife, and that kind of immorality that was in this social group. Um, that somebody's going to have to stand up against that. Somebody should, and you shouldn't just always get along with what people are saying in this social setting. And so that's TR being a moralist. And so I, I guess one of the things I, 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 I think I've said that other people haven't said so much about TR is that he had uh, moral issues were really important to him. Um, and uh, he had mixed feelings about easy divorce. Now, I personally think the reason to liberalize divorce laws in the early 20th century was that there were a lot of women who were getting beaten up and had drunk husbands, and they needed to go out and have the right to get a divorce. So that's my position. His position was a lot of his rich friends were going to Reno. Nevada had liberal divorce laws. And then they were marrying for six weeks or two months, and they were rich people who were just treating divorce as something cavalier. And he thought marriage was a serious, contract with another person um, that was lifelong and that shouldn't be broken. Now, so he and I certainly have different positions on that, but his moral concern was that people were treating human commitments lightly. And that was one of his concerns. And um, that's a story of TR's character that needs to be told. I think that's part of TR and the family. Uh, there's another issue uh, with TR, and that is he believed that wife beaters um, should be whipped in public. Okay, so this is a guy who's, who's not your average politician. But that's, again, part of the story of TR as a Victorian moralist. And part of his character, I started to see the threads where he is very deeply offended by some of the moral changes.
species in his time. In fact, his children laugh at him because um, they were part of a New York society where people would go to nightclubs and hear singers, and that was coming into Manhattan as part of the recreational options in the early 20th century, and his children all, you know, they all drank and they all went to nightclubs. Theodore Roosevelt never really understood what a nightclub was. He called them night restaurants. And you know his children just, you know, laughed at him because he was so old-fashioned. Uh, but he, he was who he was. I mean, he, that, that punching out a fellow for making that statement is, is very much who TR was. He, you know, one of the uh, things that held my interest for 27 years is that um, Theodore Roosevelt had so many sides. Uh, he was an advocate of American art and the appreciation of American art. America was a, a cultural colony of Europe up until the 20th century. That's hard to believe. I always tell my students when we study the American Revolution and the early national period, America was a weak power. Face it. Face it, we were once a weak power. We were once a little colony. We were once a place where you couldn't get a good advanced education. It's hard for us looking at a time when America it has been strong for a long time, has had excellent education for a long time, that TR lived in a day when American literature was not taught as a worthy subject in many universities. He was part of a movement to get people to take seriously American writers, Hawthorne, Melville, Whitman. Now, Whitman seems a little risque for TR, but TR um, accepted the great American writers, um, and um, he wanted Columbia to teach American literature. He wanted Americans to be able to do graduate work in America and not have to study science in Germany, which they did in his youth. Um, he wanted America to be one of the serious countries in the world. Now, nationalism can take ugly forms. Anybody who studied history can see that nationalism run wild can get us into horrible trouble. The most nationalistic example of the 20th century German nationalism and the, the Nazi movement. Uh, but I think TR's nationalism, for the most part, was pretty good for America. Min much of it was, uh, not all of it. Uh, his nationalism uh, was sympathetic to the advancement of science, sympathetic to the growth of universities, sympathetic to uh, American literature, recognized as a, an important world literature, American art. He was friends with artists like Frederick Remington, who he loved. Um, and uh, he, he uh, wanted America to be taken seriously as a country. Now, clearly, he, he, he got his wish, although it was mostly, most of this happened uh, during his lifetime, but also after he, uh, he died. Um, TR was a nationalist in the sense that he also wanted America to be like the serious European countries that took care of their poor people. And that was a very patriotic issue for him. Uh, what we call Social Security today. Um, he defended that before many Americans uh, would step up and say Social Security um, was uh, a, an idea. Uh, England and Germany had uh, that before the United States did, and America was late to provide any kind of welfare state or help for poor families, very slow. Uh, one of the things that um, I, you all probably know that there was tremendous hostility between Woodrow Wilson um, and um, Theodore Roosevelt during the last years of Theodore Roosevelt's life. And uh, sometimes at historians' conventions, they'll pit the Wilsonians against the Rooseveltians. And uh, usually you can get a pretty good argument. I got invited to a Woodrow Wilson convention a few years ago, and I was, uh, I was the only Roosevelt person there. And I, um, uh, one of the things that has always bothered me is that Woodrow Wilson had um, Princeton, because he was president of Princeton, Princeton uh, funded research and had a professor um, who did research, who defend, uh, Arthur Link defended anything that Woodrow Wilson did for a very long career. And most of the major American historians who are specialists in the early 20th century were either trained by Arthur Link or in some way touched by Arthur Link. Now, Theodore Roosevelt didn't have that institutional ballast. Um, and so his memory, um, Harvard never really 
uh, did anything for him. Um, and they, they have other presidents who went there, so they t j didn't take him very seriously. So there's never been a place where um, uh, TR could call home. And it's, it's great that maybe uh, Dickinson is willing to, to take on TR and to become the, the TR center that uh, Princeton is for Wilson. Um, but one of the things I like to tease my Wilson scholar friends about is that they often defend Wilson. In fact, one of them has just written a Wilson biography that will be out soon, and I'm sure it's a shameless defense of Wilson. Um, uh, an articulate and well-researched, but shameless defense of Wilson, because uh, that's what Wilson scholars do, um, yeah, most of them. Uh, but uh, it's one of the things that strikes me um, as different um, uh, about Wilson was a great man and the League of Nations and um, his conduct of World War I was really historically important. So the fact that we have a United Nations today and that we have a serious place, the United States has a serious place in world diplomacy, Woodrow Wilson deserves some credit for that, although TR also deserves some credit. But one of the big differences between Theodore Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson is that Theodore Roosevelt looked into the future and said, okay, we're going to have corporations, the governments, it, it's just going to happen, and it's going to be good for the economy. Government's going to have to do some regulation, and we're just going to not be able to go back to an era of horse and buggy small businesses. It's just not going to happen. Why would you go back to the economy of 1800? Why would you? You wouldn't, unless you were, you know, Woodrow Wilson campaigning in 1912. So TR argued for facing our modern America with energy, with strenuous life, with enthusiasm and courage, but he also argued that the keystone of American nationalism had to be what kind of a humane society we created in the 20th century. And um, so I think he was much more sympathetic to Social Security, unemployment insurance. Um, he was more sympathetic to women's suffrage than Woodrow Wilson, which seems like we look back and we think, why were they so slow about this? Uh, but Tio was a, um, a man who embraced the modern age um, and wanted to uh, accept it with energy. So let me stop here. Um, and uh, in, I'm delighted to have been invited to um, this symposium. I hope you will have many years ahead of being um, uh, the, the Princeton of uh, the West in the sense of this is the base, that this is the home base that TR has always needed. He always needed an academic base to have knowledge um, gathered together and to be a place where scholars could come and talk about this very, very important president. Um, and um, I, I wish you well in this exciting journey. Thank you.